In today's video, I'm going to try to save you some money by helping you avoid some bad purchases. There's a well-known correlation between the amount that you spend on camera gear and the quality that you get in return. Now, when you jump from the camera that's built into your phone to a mirrorless camera, the quality leaps up. But then, if you were to purchase a mirrorless camera that's say, three times the price of your entry-level one that you already had, you do not get three times the quality in return. This video is not going to delve too deep into any one topic. This is more of a summary where you should spend your money and when you should save it for a better purchase. Let's get into the video. When most people start out creating video, whether that's using their phone or their mirrorless camera, they just hit the record button and they let the camera figure it out. The results are fine for most viewers. However, anyone that knows what they are doing will spot shaky, over-sharpened images, shot at the wrong shutter speed with no microphone, and they'll just find it jarring to watch. My first piece of advice is therefore to get good audio. When I'm out in public shooting video, by far the most popular comment I get is, what is that on top of your camera? And I reply, it's a dead cat, which is the correct term for the windshield that protects the microphone from wind noise. And because it's got a funny name, that normally sparks a conversation. Viewers of a video are far more likely to watch a shaky, poorly exposed video than something that has got poor audio. Don't overlook audio when you first start out making video. A great budget option is the Rode Video Micro. It comes with a windshield and it's powered by the camera, so you don't have to worry about the batteries going flat. If you want to film yourself or a client who is some distance away from the camera, then I would highly recommend the DJI wireless system, with the Rode Wireless Go coming in at a close second. I'll put a link to everything in the description below. There are so many cameras available on the market that it's difficult to summarize what is good value for money. But it's important to realize that once you reach a certain quality, the amount of money that you throw at equipment does not equate to better results. Cameras that have a reasonable size sensor combined with a good lens, which we'll cover in a minute, will get you great results. On that basis, I would recommend that you get a camera that allows interchangeable lenses. Otherwise, essentially you are investing in a dead end system that you cannot upgrade. Let's discuss the video features that you should be looking for when purchasing a camera. First of all, you should be looking for a camera that shoots in 4K, ideally without a crop. The camera should have some slow motion capabilities, which is ideal if you're shooting B-roll. If your camera is not always mounted on a tripod, then find a camera that's got built-in stabilization, which is known as IBIS, and then maybe combine that with a stabilized lens. More on stabilization in a bit. Beyond the basic specs for video, if you want super slow motion in 4K, then you'll be paying a premium for this, as it takes a lot of processing power. But most cameras will allow you to slow footage down to about 50% speed as a minimum, or super slow motion at lower resolutions, such as 1080. Another pro feature, which I've only just discovered in the last 12 months, is shooting in a log profile in 10-bit. This gets very geeky very quickly, so I'll keep this simple. Shooting video in a log profile is like shooting photos in RAW. This gives you a very flat look, then you grade it in post-processing. This allows you a lot more flexibility when it comes to editing, and you also get more dynamic range as a result. See a comparison here of the same scene in a standard picture profile, where the exposure is on the limit of overexposing the highlights, versus the same scene shot in S-Log3 in 10-bit, you can see here that we retain the detail in the sky and the flat profile retains all of the details in the shadows. Dynamic range and overexposed backgrounds is an easy way to differentiate amateur video from professional. Unlike shooting stills where the image is static and you make a judgment of the lens's sharpness and character, for video you can get away with a lot more. This is simply down to the resolution as 4K is the equivalent of 12 megapixels and the fact that the same scene is constantly changing and distracting your attention away from the detail. Now I'm not saying buy cheap lenses for video work but essentially you are only asking the lens to have a resolving power of just 12 megapixels. For video you might look for a lens with stabilization which we'll talk about in a second and silent focusing motors are also a must. 
Whether you prefer to shoot with primes or zooms is just personal preference and will depend upon what you are shooting. But for ultimate flexibility, you should get a lens that has a fixed aperture throughout the zoom range, which will avoid the exposure changing as you're zooming in. Although third party lenses can save you a lot of money, watch reviews on them before purchasing as they may not have the same focusing capabilities and the stabilization of native lenses tends to be favored by the camera manufacturers. If you intend on taking your camera off the tripod, then your audience will thank you for some sort of stabilization. Nowadays, there are quite a few options. You'll find lenses with built-in stabilization. Some cameras have IBIS, which is short for in-body image stabilization. This involves the sensor moving around inside the camera to counteract any movement made by the camera operator. There is also digital stabilization, which is what cameras like the GoPros and Insta360 cameras rely upon to create smooth video. This is computational stabilization, which crops into the sensor using spare pixels around the edge to balance out camera movements. This works exactly the same as stabilizing your footage in post using say Adobe Premiere or Final Cut, for example. And finally, the most effective is using your camera on a gimbal. There are many options available from the DJI Pocket 2, gimbals for your mobile phone, all the way up to full frame and beyond. DJI are the market leader when it comes to gimbals, but there are also good offerings from Xi'an, which are some quite compact solutions. Which type of stabilization is best for you will depend upon what you're shooting, whether you want the shot to feel natural, sometimes a bit of camera shake might be appropriate. The focal length and the speed of the camera movements will also dictate the best stabilization method. Most modern cameras with IBIS and enhanced digital stabilization do a very good job of creating watchable video. If you're looking for a professional finish, then I would recommend investing in a gimbal. Another consideration is the size and the weight of your camera setup. The smaller the camera, the more likely you are to get micro jitters, whereas a heavier camera requires a stronger grip and a different stance that involves tucking your elbows close into your body and doing the ninja walk. Gimbals do not, however, remove the bounce that you get when you walk, also known as the Z-axis. And the only way to overcome this is to film from, say, a passenger's seat of a car, use a one wheel or use a skateboard, which I've used on many occasions to film real estate interiors. There are too many tripods to choose from nowadays and I've made my fair share of tripod reviews on this channel, I'll put a link to one of them up here. But when it comes to buying a tripod for video, you'll see that they offer a fluid head, which essentially creates resistance as you pan and tilt the tripod head when you're doing camera movements. If you try this with a regular tripod, the movements will not be as smooth, which is one of the distinguishing features between a tripod for stills versus a tripod for video. If you're in a gimbal, then you don't need to worry about getting a fluid head for your tripod, as you can pan and tilt the camera using the joystick or the app to achieve the same effect. You also have a lot more control over the speed when doing this on a gimbal. Other than the obvious things, such as choosing a sturdy tripod that is compact and lightweight, enough not to be a burden, I'd recommend doing your research before purchasing a tripod. If you want camera support with a bit more flexibility than a tripod, be sure to look at monopods which have the triple feet, as these have got smaller footprint and are much quicker to set up. To elevate the production value of your videos and make the filming process easier, then you will find a camera cage a really helpful investment. Most mirrorless cameras have a thread on the bottom of them to attach a tripod plate and a hot shoe on top of the camera designed for a camera flash or a microphone. If you intend on using any on-camera lighting, an external monitor or any other accessories, then you're going to have to find a new way of attaching them to your camera. The best way of doing so is to use a camera cage. Small rig are my go-to for this. I use an L bracket for my Sony a7 III, which allows me to easily switch between landscape and portrait orientation for photos and videos. To expand upon this, I'm using a complete cage for the Sony a7 IV with a top handle and a side handle. Not only does this allow me to hold my camera with two hands, making the footage far more stable, but the handle allows for easy low level shots and it's a much easier way of carrying your camera. And yes, I am aware that I installed the handle back to front at first, but I quickly realized and I flipped it around. I also purchased a flexible hand grip, which provides additional support, especially when you're holding it with one hand. As you can see, this cage accommodates fixing points in every place that you can imagine. This allows me to fix a microphone on the handle at the front or the back, a wireless microphone in the top corner, a light on the side. I have continued access to all of the ports on the side of my camera. And because this cage wraps all the way around the camera, it provides extra protection from impact should the worst happen. Since I'm shooting in a log profile, as I discussed earlier, the in-camera recording looks a bit flat. 
but with an external monitor I can apply a LUT to show me exactly what the end result will look like. I borrowed an Atomos Ninja to use with this setup, which is without a doubt the industry go-to for external monitors. But when you add the external battery, and let's not overlook the cost of the monitor and the hard drive, I found it to be a heavy and expensive addition to my camera setup. I've discovered that I can use my iPhone as an external monitor with the Monitor Plus app. This allows me to control my camera via Wi-Fi, monitor exposure, focus, install LUTs, as well as de-squeeze anamorphic footage. Now, since the iPhone is connected via Wi-Fi, there is a delay of about half a second to a second, which will not be acceptable in a professional situation, but it does allow me to put my camera across the room and I have my iPhone or my iPad next to me to ensure that I'm correctly exposed and I'm in focus. Whereas if you were using an Atomos Ninja, you'd have an HDMI cable dragging across the room. Small Rig makes so many accessories catered for each camera model, so I'll put a link to their website below and a link to the specific products that I find useful. Filters are completely necessary for video work, as unsexy as filters can be, primarily to maintain a constant shutter speed. There are of course special effects filters which allow subtle diffusion to take out the digital look of modern cameras. If you want complete control of your shutter speed, and ISO, then I would recommend getting a set of variable NDs. These are typically two to five stops and six to nine stops. Magnetic filters are certainly quicker and they are my preferred option. I recently published a review of Freewell's latest offering, I'll put a link up here. If you wanna be a bit more run and gun, then I would recommend a magnetic fixed ND. I typically shoot at f2.8, sometimes f1.8 outside, and this commands a six stop ND filter, also known as an ND64. Freewell make a magnetic system which is simple, great quality, and as fast as it gets. If you want to get a future-proof ND, no matter what lenses you own, then consider getting the Revo ring adapter and an 82mm filter. This allows you to fit the same filter quickly to any of your lenses. We are living in a great time to be content creators. Once upon a time, drones used to take up a box the size of a camera bag. Now they fold down to a size that you can fit in your pocket. Drones are quickly being updated and replaced all the time with new features and extended flight time being added with each iteration. If you just wanna have a bit of fun with a drone, then look at getting one that weighs in under 250 grams, as the distance you have to keep from people is dramatically reduced. Simply put, the lighter the drone, the less harm it would cause somebody if it fell out of the sky. If you intend on doing any commercial work or wish to fly a drone heavier than 250 grams, then you'll need to pass an exam, at which point you might as well look at one of the higher spec drones anyway. I opted to get the Mavic 2 Pro, which served me well, and I don't feel the need to upgrade it even three years later. A bigger drone will have a larger sensor, more capability of fighting stronger winds, and interestingly, the larger blades have a lower hum to them, whereas the smaller drones sound like a swarm of bees and attract a bit more attention from onlookers than the larger drones. One last piece of advice when it comes to drones. I would invest in an external controller with a built-in screen. Not only are the screens bigger and brighter than your phone, there is nothing more stressful than flying a drone using your phone and someone is trying to call you. I've accumulated this camera equipment over the course of 10 to 15 years and I don't recommend anybody upgrade their camera or lens simply because it's the latest version. Make friends with others that use the same camera brand as you and you can just share kit, that's much cheaper. I hope you found this video helpful. What would you put in your top eight camera gear accessories for creating video? Let me know in the comments down below. And as always, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and I'll see you in the next video.